Welcome to the age of the great guilds. After the passing of the second shadow, when dragons ruled the twilight sky and the stars were bright and numerous, that humankind began to thirst again for dominion over nature. Their weapon was industry, and they wielded it with confidence. One by one, the mysteries of light and darkness fell before the engines of progress. Whole nations came to believe that nothing lay beyond the power of their own arrogance. Competition was fierce in those productive days. Skilled labor became a valuable commodity, and so the tradespeople of the land banded themselves together to promote their common interests and to protect their secrets. These professional societies swelled in power as their membership grew. A few, such as the blacksmiths and the clerics, acquired vast territories with private armies to defend them. Thus began the age of the great guilds. Vast city-states devoted to the absolute control of knowledge, held together by stern traditions of pride and of fear. Within the span of a few lifetimes, the commerce of the world was in their hands. But not all of the guilds were equally ambitious. The spinners of thread and weavers of fabric wished only to pursue their labor without interference. They did not involve themselves in the politics of the day and left the administration of taxes and wars to others. So the guild of weavers never attained the prominence of the shepherds or the glassmakers. Their number was small, for their strict rules forbade membership to any but the child of a member. Marriage outside the guild was discouraged and eventually outlawed. Outsiders regarded the weavers' ingrown society with distaste, yet their customs were not without benefit. The natural talents of their membership were nurtured and purified, generation after generation, until the greatest among them wove fabrics of such extraordinary beauty that the whole world wondered at their achievements. Goods bearing the seal of the guild commanded a premium price, and the weavers amassed considerable wealth in this period, which they quietly hoarded. Like the other guilds, the weavers had evolved a philosophy of living based on the tools and terminology of their handiwork. They beheld in their great frames of wood and metal a symbol of universal truth and found ways to work subtle patterns of influence 
into the fabrics they wove. The cloth of the guild soon became known for virtues other than mere beauty. Certain weaves seemed to possess remarkable powers of healing. Others held a charm against ill fortune. In the fullness of time, the art of the weavers transcended the limits of physical cloth. They abandoned the flax and dyes of their ancestors to wield the very stuff of light and music and spun new patterns directly in the fabric of reality. The ignorant looked upon these works with fear and called them witchcraft. Many of the guild were persecuted, a few were hanged. To protect their heritage, the weavers expended a small fraction of their wealth to purchase a rocky island off the mainland coast. They packed up their spindles and skeins and shuttles and retreated from the company of men to refine their arts in solitude. Many wars and plagues followed. Mighty guilds fell into ruin. Others rose to surpass them. The exhausted world all but forgot the humble guild of weavers, and few found reason to visit their home, an island of mystery shrouded in perpetual mist, shunned by sailors, which ancient maps call Loom. Signor, bless you, child. Out of bed so soon. What brings you? I wish an audience with the elders. Look at you, pale as lace, and your hands trembling. Sit down. The idea of coming this way alone. You wouldn't be up and about if I was still midwifing. You can be sure of that. Now, what's this you say? An audience? I must speak to them. The elders. At once. The elders? I see. Concerning? A matter of importance. Please, Edgel. An audience? Oh, my. Wait here. Old Edgel will get you in. I do not remember summoning you, Hedger. Oh, forgive me, Elder Atropos. Lady Signor is in the antechamber. She desires an audience. Now? So late in the afternoon? The girl is not yet recovered, Your Reverence. Yet she comes alone. I will speak. Signor. Elders, hear me. I cannot remain silent. That much is obvious. Lady Signa, we are grieved to hear of your loss. Do not grieve on my account, Elder. Save your sympathy for the rest of the guild. I am not aware that our guild is in need of sympathy. How many more babies must die before the guild will earn your condolences? <gasps> that is no way to address an elder, young woman. Is it not? Then give me the words, Elder Lachesis. Tell me how to express my anger. Anger does not become you. Calm yourself, child. Tell us what it is that troubles you so. Our seed is barren, Elder Clothos. We have lived under the rules of membership too long. Most of our children are born dead. Many that survive are monsters beyond hope. Our numbers are failing. 
Less than a score of us remain. And all in the name of rules written in ignorance, obsolete a thousand years. The same rules that distilled our not inconsiderable talent. What purpose will our talent serve when there is no one left to practice it? The same purpose it serves now, Signa. The fulfillment of the pattern. That is our only purpose. You speak of the pattern as if it were our master. But the long tapestry speaks of a time when we were the masters. Please, elders, there is power in the loom. So, it is power you seek. What would you have us do with this power? Use it. I beg you, Elder Clothos, Use the loom to end our suffering and bring life and health to our children. The changes in the pattern would be trivial. Any one of us could work the thread. All we lack is courage. Do you make this request on behalf of the guild or on your own behalf? Uh, both. Signa. It is true, the great loom holds the power you seek. It is also true that our ancestors wielded this power freely. It may be that they understood the pattern better than we, or perhaps the threads were easier to grasp in those simpler times. It does not matter. We dare not tamper with the pattern now. Its subtleties have passed beyond our understanding. It is all we can do to observe our destiny in its fulfillment. You ask for a miracle, Signa, but we are not gods. We are interpreters. Interpreters? You are nothing but caretakers. How can you squander the heritage our ancestors gave their lives to preserve? Your pious hand-wringing mocks their devotion. Who are the weavers now? And who are the woven? Enough! I have tolerated your hysteria out of sympathy for your bereavement. But I cannot allow you to utter blasphemy in the presence of the loom itself. You will return to your tent and forget that this conversation ever occurred. If I hear of it again outside this chamber, you will suffer the penalty prescribed to all who defy the will of the elders. Must I specify that penalty... No, Elder Atropos. Then go. And do not judge us, Signa. Only the pattern may judge. are afraid to use it. I am not afraid. Oh, the colors in the pattern. Dancing. The shadow of rainbows. Oh. One gray thread. Gray goes with every color. Invisible. No one will notice one gray thread. To work. Here's the trick. Tie it to the end of the shuttle. Just let the harness do the work. Throw. Beat. Travel. Rest. Throw. Beat. Travel. Rest. Back. And forth. Well, poor Angel. Rest. Throw. 
feet. Rest. Rest. Stage is sick now. Too late. Poor child. You understand the gravity of what you have done? Only the pattern may judge, Elder Atropos. We cannot allow this outrage to go unpunished. Do what you must. This baby is alive. I am content. Surrender the child to Dame Hedjo. Care for him the way you did for me, old friend. It's the only way I know. I am ready. Lady Signa, you are guilty of treason against the Guild. You have breached the sanctity of the loom and compromised the fulfillment of the pattern to indulge your own selfish desires in direct defiance of the elders. You are henceforth and forever outcast from the guild of weavers. You shall neither behold this child nor set foot upon this island again. From now until the end of your days, you shall wander the skies in perpetual solitude. Your mournful cry shall be a lesson to all who would defy their destiny. village saw the great swan disappear across the sea that night. But it did not take long for them to hear of Lady Signa's defiance in the sanctuary and the elders' terrible vengeance. All were curious to behold the new infant, a child born not of woman, but out of the loom itself, and whose creation was unforeseen. It was decreed that the child be raised outside the ways of the guild until his coming of age, 17 years hence, when his future would be decided by a high council. The old serving woman, Hetchel, agreed to raise the loom child as her own. She named the little boy Bobbin. Bobbin? Bobbin, wake up, child. Uh, That's right, dear. Out of bed. Still dark. I know, little one. Get up quickly and get dressed. Why? Sleepy. There's something outside I want you to see. Quickly now, before the sun rises. up here. I told you to bring your quilt, didn't I? Here. My shawl is warm. I don't see anything. Patience. She will come. She's come every year ever since you were born. What does she look like? She looks... Wait. There. Between the trees. 
No, no. Only an owl. The village looks small from up here. Which star is that? A bright one. That is the morning star. You can even see it in the daytime if the sun is right. Look down there, flying low across the water. Do you see? It's just a seagull. Look again. Oh, a swan, Bobbin, a white swan. Happy birthday, poor boy. Here she comes. Look, she's flying over. She is beautiful. Yes, still beautiful. Why does she sound so sad? Because she is alone, proud, and alone. She's flying away. Where is she going, Hetchel? Out beyond the pattern, I expect. Can we go visit? Stand away from the edge. No, little Bobbin. Those who are born of the pattern are hemmed into its web forever. Where that swan goes, we cannot follow. The sun is in my eyes. You're yawning. <laughs> Come back to home and bed for you. The years were kind to Bob and Threadbare. The boy grew tall and slender, with wide blue eyes that sparkled with mischief and intelligence. Yet Bob and never went to school. The elders of the guild would not permit it. The other children were told he was a halfwit, and they taunted him with terrible cruelty, throwing stones if he came too near. And so the friendless boy spent his days in solitude, combing the beaches for sticks of firewood, and exploring the hills and forests of the weaver's little island, until no one knew them better than he. Old Hetchel cared for Bobbin like her own son. She saw his growing bitterness and begged the elders to end his cruel exile. But the elders were afraid of Bobbin, and not without reason. His unexpected birth had thrown the pattern into chaos. Year after year, they watched with growing apprehension. As shadows of apocalypse spread across the web in the loom, Bobbin's thread was weaving its way towards a destiny of overwhelming consequence. The pattern was disintegrating. No one knew how to stop it. The elders never told Bobbin who he was or how he came to be. They prayed that Bobbin would be unable to fulfill his destiny, so long as he never left the island and never learned the ways of spell weaving. They did not suspect that Bobbin's education had already begun. Not tonight, Mother Hetchel. Especially tonight. Draw the curtains, boy. Sit here by the fire. Now, tell me, how many threads are there in a draft? Four. Their names? The throw. That's one. The beat. Two. The treadle and the rest. Good. Let's see if you remember the draft I taught you. Spin it for me. Ha 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 ha. Pity. Listen to me. Now you know what the other boys do in school all day. I guess I'll never learn to weave. Rubbish! Do you suppose every weaver starts out with a golden throat? It takes years of practice, years, 
How long do you suppose the elders have been weaving? Nearly as long as I have, and that is a very long time indeed. But where do I begin? You begin with this. Do you know what it is? No. This is called a distaff. Our ancestors used a distaff to spin flax into thread. We use it to spin music and light into threads of influence. Show me. Hold the distaff in your hands, like this. Don't be afraid. Now, spin that draft I taught you again. Just the first thread. Hmm. Flat. Spin it again, dear. This time, slide the thread high in your throat, like this. Hmm. Can you do that? I think so. It's glowing. I was telling you when your pitch is correct. Try the beat and treble threads. You learn quickly. What happens if I spin all four? Oh, let's find out, shall we? Let me shut this first. All right. Listen carefully. I want you to spin those four threads again. Wait for the distaff to glow before you go on to the next. As you spin the last thread, point the distaff at the ball of yarn inside my knitting basket. But you just closed it. Indeed, those four threads form a pattern of opening. You're going to lift up the top of that basket without even touching it. Whenever you're ready. Does it hurt? <laughs> Tingles a bit. Remember, concentrate on the ball of yarn inside the basket. Spin. Concentrate. Now, point. Not at the window. Wow! Shh. Blow out that light. Sit. Still for a minute. Good. I, I don't think anybody heard us. What other drafts do you know? Give me that. You've done enough weaving for one night. Off to bed with you. You have a big day ahead, and we both have to get up very early. Let me go alone this year, Mother Hetchel. Alone? Well, I suppose you're old enough. Go alone, Bobbin. I don't mind staying in bed late this time. It was still dark when Bobbin awoke, quietly so as not to disturb old Hetchel. He slipped into his warm grey robe and stepped outside into the chill before dawn. The climb up the cliff path was steep and dangerous in the darkness. Only the waves crashing against the rocks below broke the stillness. Bright stars twinkled overhead. It was still half an hour before sunrise when Bobbin reached the top of the cliff. He sat down beneath a crooked old tree and leaned back. To wait for the seventeenth visit of the great swan. In less than a minute, he was fast asleep.